Okay, so now we move to next speaker uh, and we uh, go back to academia now. So, Raffaello, maybe Hello. you want to... Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, okay, so maybe you can share and then I'll make it short. Uh... I will start trying to share the slide. So, hopefully you see the title slide now. Yes, yeah, we Perfect. can see. Okay, so next speaker is uh, Professor Raffaello Potestio from the University of Trento uh, in Italy. Uh, so uh, just a few words about Raffaello. So Raffaello got uh, his PhD in 2010, uh, right Raffaello, with uh, under supervision of uh, uh, Christian Micheletti here in Sissa. Then Raffaello moved uh, to, to Mainz, to Mainz at, at the Max Planck, uh, to the Max Planck Institute for Polymer Research in the group of uh, uh, Kurt Kramer, uh, where uh, uh, basically started his work on, let's say, coarse graining, uh, genetic coarse graining, and uh, on uh, molecules and, uh, and, um, and, and biomolecules. And then Raffaello uh, got uh, uh, a position in, in Trento uh, and also in NERC a few years ago, where he started, his, and so with which uh, he started his own research group there. And now he's an associate professor at the University of Trento, and today will tell us about communication pathways in an IG, IgG4 antibody uh, on a multi scale study. So, Raffaello, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Angelo, also for uh, anticipating the customary uh, presentation slide. That um, uh, it's not something I usually do, but of course, in this uh, alumni meeting, uh, it's a pleasure for me to stress the fact that. Uh, my career path uh, took me to Trento through Trieste. Uh, as you might know, people in Italy think that Trento and Trieste are basically five centimeters apart. This is definitely not the case, unfortunately. Uh, fortunately, we have mountains, but not the sea. And um, yeah, after uh, the university in Rome, I went to CISA for the PhD. And uh, I, I think it is worth uh, mentioning in, in which conditions I was when I started the PhD, which is this. And, uh, and this is the condition in which Christian decided to accept me as a PhD student. So uh, I cannot but thank him for making this uh, leap of faith. And uh, I agree with Andrea that uh, a PhD in CISA, uh, yeah, PhD in CISA certainly does you good. And I'm very happy to be uh, here today telling you something about the work that uh, we have been doing uh, in my group here in Trento, you see here the, the happy faces uh, the, the, of the people who have really uh, carried out the work that uh, I'm going to, to tell you something about. So uh, I think that during the last, the, the past few, two years, you have seen this image several times. Uh, of course, this is the COVID virus. Uh, I am very happy to let you know that I will not be talking about the COVID virus today. Actually, I will be focusing on something however, related somehow to that, which is antibodies. And in particular, I will focus on one antibody, which is pembrolizumab, the, uh, which, is, uh, which is a modified antibody. So it is a, an antibody, which of course, uh, which occurs naturally in cells of several organisms. However, it has been engineered to act as a, um, as a drug uh, for pharmace pharmaceutical needs. The, the reason why it has been engineered is that this uh, antibody in the, in the wild type uh, can undergo a process in which the two arms, the two fab arms, detach. You should see, if you see my pointer, you see uh, here two, two uh, yellow lines. So these two yellow lines are not there in the, in the natural antibody because uh, they represent cysteine bridges, covalent bridges, which have not uh, which are not present in the, in the natural antibody. And because of that, uh, the, these antibody can, uh, can separate the two, between the two arms and undergo an exchange with other antibodies. For pharmaceutical reasons, people uh, had to engineer it so that it stays there, so that the two arms remain, uh, remain there. And uh, it is customarily used uh, typically for uh, several kinds of uh, treatments, most of which involve cancer somehow. Uh, so this is a fairly huge molecule. It is um, uh, more than 1,300 uh, residue large uh, protein. It is a multi-chain multi protein. And uh, at, the, at the first step of the, of the function of the molecule, you have the binding 
uh, with an antigen in particular, uh, one of the main antigens uh, it interacts with is this PD-1 protein, which is part of a larger complex. And this interaction happens here, which is the, the region where the, uh, uh, where the antigen binds. Uh, here you have the binding site, the variable in the variable region of this chain, of this, uh, uh, of this large uh, macromolecular complex. Now, what we did was to uh, investigate the, the inner life, if you want, of this molecule by means of molecular dynamic simulations, by means of all atom molecular dynamic simulations. So we want to understand something about the, um, the internal dynamics of this thing, because uh, I, will, I will make a step back. You see that uh, these, let's say, three blocks, three large macro blocks, are connected together by uh, by hinge by a hinge uh, which is composed by uh, two uh, relatively unstructured uh, segments of the of the proteins, uh, which allows them a large amount of flexibility. So the question was from our side, uh, what kind of flexibility is this? Is there uh, some relationship between the, uh, the the dynamics internal to the various domains and the way uh, the system arranges itself in the at the large scale, is there a, re a relationship between the binding state of the um, uh, of the antibody and its large scale conformational arrangement? In principle, you have three balloons which are attached together by threads, and you could expect that no correlation exists. Of course, the hinge is relatively short. For this antibody, you might expect something. So we wanted to investigate this something. And we did that uh, performing uh, a relatively large amount of molecular dynamic simulations. So we have for each state, apo and holo. So we have the unbound uh, antibody and the bound antibody bound to the PD-1 uh, protein. Uh, for each of these two states, we, pro we performed uh, four molecular dynamic simulations, which are independent. However, uh, starting from the same initial configuration, but of course with randomized velocities. And these four trajectories are nano, uh, 500 nanoseconds long each. And the, um, uh, the first step in, this, in the analysis of the, uh, of the system was to perform a clusterization of the frames. That is, we consider the frames of the trajectory of the four trajectories for each state altogether. And we try to, uh, to, to uh, cluster the conformations together so as to identify macro states. The, uh, the clustering took place through a hierarchical clustering strategy, which is a relatively way of putting together uh, conformations based on their distance, which is, which is of course given by the root mean square deviation. Uh, we employed a threshold that allowed us to identify a decent quotes number of clusters. That is a number of clusters that is large enough for the clusters to make sense to distinguish different configurations. But at the same time, it's not so large that eventually you start breaking down clusters that are um, uh, only, uh, only slightly different from each other. So this is a very uh, qualitative way of, uh, of making this decision. And with clustering, typically, this is the case. And I think maybe uh, Giovanni and Alessandro might confirm something about this. But uh, eventually, we ended up with this uh, partitioning. So as a first thing you see, that there is a difference between the apo and the holo state in the number of clusters. In the apo state, you have five, uh, six clusters, which have almost the same uh, population. If you want, you have three clusters that are of the same size, and other three clusters which are uh, similar in size among them, but smaller than the than the first three. And uh, the holo state, on the other hand, is populated by four clusters. Uh, which roughly share, we share roughly equally the, the, the size with a fourth cluster, which is relatively slightly populated. If you look at the, at the properties of, the, uh, of these clusters, which of course uh, contain together conformations that come from, uh, from all trajectories uh, at the same time. So for example, you see that cluster three here takes frames that come from the four trajectories independently. Clusters uh, four and five here only include conformations that have been visited in the fourth trajectory and so on and so forth. So if you look to, uh, into the clusters and try to figure out what happens in there, you see that there is a substantial variability in general. Regarding the upper state, you see that conformations cover a large number of uh, radii of, of duration and dispersion within each cluster. 
which is given by, uh, by these bars. Uh, it is interesting to note that the, uh, the initial conformation from which all trajectories start is about here. If, if I'm not mistaken, it is precisely this, uh, within this cluster here. So you have that uh, whatever, um, starting from the same configuration, you have clusters uh, that represent conformations, uh, which are populated by conformations that tend to expand starting from the initial configuration and other clusters in which the, the system tends to, I wouldn't say collapse, but certainly shrink in terms of conformation of the overall arrangement of the, uh, of the structure. In the hollow state, something similar happens, but not quite as much as in the upper state. So you see that the conformation of variability of the hollow state is way uh, smaller. It's, uh, I would say, half the size of what you have in the upper state. So in a sense, uh, this would suggest that the, that the binding with the, uh, with the antigen uh, favors uh, a, a more rigid, uh, a stiffer uh, conformation for the, for the antibody. And you see that in the number of clusters, as well as in the variability, the conformation of variability that you have in each cluster. If you look at the binding site, which is of course an important thing, uh, to, to, to understand, to figure out whether some relationship exists between, this, uh, between the, the, the binding and the overall arrangement of the antibody, you see that uh, the, in the upper state, the binding site has a certain uh, conformation of variability. So you have the root mean square deviation from the conformation of the binding site in the initial configuration, which cluster by cluster uh, covers a broad range of conformations, and in particular, the uh, let's say the maxima of these distributions are not necessarily in the same place. This is not the case for the hollow state, in which you have a slightly smaller um, uh, range of uh, root mean square deviations. But most importantly, you have that the bulk of these distributions is definitely more concentrated in in the same region for the four clusters region which is populated by the uh, upper state as well. So this uh, suggested us the possibility that the, uh, that the upper state and the hollow state share something from the point of view of the binding site, as well as from the point of view of the um, overall arrangement. And indeed, if you see, for example, what happens to cluster 0H, this is the root mean square deviation of the binding site in the, uh, in, in the first cluster, the zeroth cluster for the hollow state, which corresponds to this conformation here. Now, there is a conformation among the ones in which you do not have the binding side, the, sorry, uh, the, the PD-1, the, the antigen, which is structurally very similar to this one, which is, sorry, this one. So the 1A conformation, even though it might not look uh, so uh, just looking at the conformation, it turns out uh, quantitatively that uh, this structure is the closest among all the others to the structure at the global level that you have in the uh, zeroth cluster of the, of the holo state. In the, uh, in the holo state, you have a distribution of configuration in the active site, in the, in the binding site, which is, uh, uh, sorry, in the upper state, which is this. So cluster 1A, uh, you have this population, the, the black line for the uh, for the binding site, which is very different from what you have in the binding state. However, the moment you remove from this conformation the binding site, the, sorry again, the 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 antigen, the PD one, you have that even though the conformation at the global level remains in proximity uh, of where it started, that is this cluster, in a simulation of in a few simulations of one hundred nanoseconds of length, you have the, the, the binding site immediately relaxes the conformation, which is closer to what you have in the, um, in the corresponding conformation in the upper state. So there is something that tells you that if the uh, antibody is in this conformation in absence of the, uh, of the antigen, the binding site would like to be in a certain conformation, which is not the one in which it is when uh, when it is in interaction with the, with the antigen. So the, this suggests that there might be some relationship between the conformation of the system 
at the uh, at the large level, at the level of uh, uh, of the overall arrangement of the antibody, and what happens in the binding site. To figure something out about this in a more detailed manner, in a more quantitative manner, we started uh, making use of, um, of an analysis which relies on mutual information. Mutual information is a quantity that you can compute that allows you to, uh, to say something about the correlation between two, two residues in this case, uh, beyond what you would get in a regular uh, PCA, in a regular um, uh, principal component analysis, because this, this goes uh, beyond linear correlations. So you, you, you have the possibility of computing joint probability distributions uh, that, that uh, are computed on the displacement of the, um, uh, of the residue, for example, the ith residue from its average position. So this is the probability of having residue i uh, displaced by a quantity xi, a distance xi, but from its uh, equilibrium position, from its reference position. And this is, uh, of course, the equivalent for residue j. And you can compute the mutual information contained in this probability distribution by comparing it by means of a, what is effectively a kullback leibler divergence. Uh, you compare it with the, um, with the product of the marginals of these distributions. So in, uh, uh, in a nutshell, if you have no correlation, the joint probability distribution is equal to the product of the marginals, because it is exactly the, the product of the marginals. If there is correlation uh, that the product, product of the marginals does not entail, then this quantity is larger than zero. And the nice thing is that you can employ this information, this mutual information, to construct a network, to build up a network of uh, interactions within the, of correlations, if you want, uh, within, the, uh, within the system uh, that you can employ to uh, highlight uh, pathways of uh, communication uh, within the system. I put a, a, a question mark in the allosteric here because, of course, this uh, is, a, is a dangerous word to employ. So I wouldn't say that these are necessarily allosteric pathways, but certainly there is some interaction, some communication that takes place within the system at the equilibrium level, of course. We have analyzed this uh, with, uh, by means of equilibrium uh, quantities. But the result that comes out uh, certainly suggests that there is, uh, there is communication that takes place from the binding side of the antibody, at least the one that is, uh, that is more free to move, and the rest of the antibody. Why did I mention the one that is more free to move? Uh, I did that because this antibody, because the initial configuration that we employed in our uh, simulation is, of course, the crystallographic one. Uh, in which the antibody is arranged in a tilted conformation that uh, allows for a substantial interaction between the, uh, the FAB1 and the FC domain. So in this respect, we consider this uh, binding site to be, uh, to be the one uh, that has larger accessibility to, uh, to, the, to the antigen. And indeed, we see that uh, it is from there that you have the largest amount of uh, pathways, not necessarily all the pathways. For example, here you see that uh, pathways start from these other variable region as well. But certainly, two things are uh, striking in, this, uh, in these images. One is the fact that there are substantial communication pathways. So there, is, uh, there are channels that are definitely more populated than other, uh, um, than other bonds that you can identify in the system. And the other thing is that several pathways go through the, um, the hinge. Some pathways do not go through the hinge. So for example, they take uh, a shortcut uh, through the interactions that take place directly, for example, from between one fab and the other. But most of the interactions, especially in the, in the bound state, take place through the, uh, through the hinge. This might sound slightly uh, obvious in the sense that the hinge is the part that physically connects the, uh, the fab chains, the, the fab domains to the FC. However, uh, you see that alternatives are possible. So uh, uh, it is certainly something uh, to, to, to highlight, something that comes to our attention that there are these communication pathways. And indeed, we focused a bit on the role that uh, the hinge plays. And you see that uh, 
when the hinge is bound to uh, when the when the antibody is bound to the uh, to the antigen to the PD one, there is a reduced flexibility in the hinge. So, so the hinge becomes more rigid. In a sense, this tells you that something changes in the uh, in uh, in the hinge, which is a consequence of the uh, of the higher stiffness of the more of the larger constraints or restraints that you have in the binding site because of the presence of the antibody. The, the, the hinge on top of that is characterized by the presence of high centrality residues. Centrality is a measure that in graph theory tells you how many pathways pass through in a network, pass through a certain set of, uh, of nodes. And in the hinge, you have a large amount of these nodes. So the, um, uh, these pieces of, of information suggest that the, uh, the, the, the hinge uh, provides a response to the binding site, might have consequences in the behavior of the, of the rest of the system. So these, uh, the modifications that take place in the hinge reflect on the arrangement of the system as a whole, of the protein as a whole. And, uh, and of course, the, in the moment in which you have some, some, something taking place in such a relevant part of the anti antibody as the binding site, uh, these modifications are communicated through the rest of the, uh, the antibody, mainly importantly passing through the hinge. Additionally, we notice that uh, if you perform a calculation, uh, an approximate calculation, of course, of the binding free energy uh, between the, uh, the, the binding site and the PD-1, depending on the cluster, you see that the, uh, the strongest binding uh, that, that you observe is the one that is correlated, that, that, is, uh, that takes place in the cluster, which is the most correlated. So if you consider a measure of how much correlation is there uh, among the um, within the cluster, sorry, within the domains of the uh, of the antibody, you see that when the um, when when the binding is present, when the uh, when the PD one is in, uh, is present uh, and interacts with the with the antibody, the strongest binding is the one that takes place in the in the cluster where within each domain you have the largest amount of correlation, which of course means also the largest amount of uh, of rigidity, if you want, within the uh, within the domain. So the idea, the suggestion is that the presence of the uh, of the antigen of the of the PD one in this case modulates in a substantial manner the uh, not only the binding site, which is something that one can consider relatively uh, obvious and natural, but also the the remainder of the of the antibody. Something that is interesting to notice is the fact that if you compare what happens uh, in terms of correlation at the global level and at the level of domains in the, in the system, uh, as quantified by, the, by a measure, this, uh, um, uh, this correlation coefficient, coefficient, which is a measure of the overall uh, mutual information that you have within uh, a certain uh, a certain set of residues, you see that if you consider this correlation that takes place uh, within the domains, you have that this substantially doesn't um, uh, doesn't change much. So the uh, the presence of the uh, of the binding site for the different class that classes doesn't change substantially. Uh, I might have said the opposite before, so I apologize for that. You have that uh, the inter value, which is the, uh, the the value of the correlation among different domains, is the uh, is modulated uh, substantially by the pres by, by the different clusters, and you have that the strongest the stronger the binding, uh, as it is the case here for the cluster zero, the uh, the stronger the correlation among domains. And this also correlates with other uh, with other other observables that you have. For example, the root mean square fluctuations that take place uh, in the in the antigen itself uh, is uh, is the lowest when the when the binding uh, is the strongest. Again, this let's say uh, correlates with what you would expect for a strong binding, and uh, you have large uh, 
large surfaces uh, in the interaction with the, with the PD-1 and so on and so forth. So this, um, this is a, a first indication. This is, of course, a, a, a first work that we have uh, done that we are doing on this, uh, on this antibody. Uh, and there is much more to do, but this first analysis suggests that uh, antibodies, in particular this antibody, which has a relatively short hinge, uh, are not just you know, three large rigid blocks connected by uh, relatively loose uh, um, threads. Actually, there is, a, there is a substantial amount of correlation within the, entire, uh, within the entire system, and this correlation is modulated by the presence of, uh, of the antigen. And this can um, can have also an important important consequences in the uh, in the design of antibodies. So the moment you understand this is let's say the, the long term perspective. The, the moment you understand what kind of uh, uh, of consequences from the point of view of the overall arrangement, uh, the binding with the binding uh, with the antigen has uh, for the for the whole antibody, you might even uh, conceive the. Uh, uh, the deploy of, mod of modifications in the uh, in the system in the in the whole antibody that, for example, increases its flexibility, reduces its flexibility, uh, favors or uh, disfavors the uh, uh, the how prone the uh, the other uh, binding site is to, uh, to to bind with the uh, uh, with the antigen, uh, because we have seen that there are these communication pathways that if confirmed if they're, and if we learn to, uh, to play with them, can be exploited for, for the design of, uh, of antibodies with specific, um, specific features from the functional point of view. So this, uh, this work relied heavily, I would say, on uh, all out molecular dynamic simulations. And these were tough enough for a system that is composed by not even for 1,400 residues. And this is Let's say this is not a small protein, of course, but it is not even uh, a particularly large protein. We have seen uh, even larger proteins. So, for example, the the, the infamous spy protein of the um, of the uh, coronavirus is roughly the size of the antibody. Uh, of this antibody, however, you have complications due to the uh, to the fact that there are the glycans uh, to to be considered in this case, of course. Uh, I didn't mention the fact that this antibody uh, also uh, happens to, to be covered uh, in uh, coated in sugar, if you want, to be covered in, um, uh, in glycans. We performed our simulations without the glycans. We performed simulations with the glycans, and these are the ones that we are uh, investigating at the moment. Uh, this protein also have, uh, has the, uh, the issue that it is embedded in a membrane, so you have to simulate the membrane and so on and so forth. Then you can go to even larger uh, systems that are entire viruses. And of course, performing all out molecular dynamic simulations for entire viruses is something particularly obnoxious to say the least. So in, in the worst case scenario, you simply cannot perform the simulations. Uh, the systems are too large. The processes uh, that you have to, in, that you want to investigate take simply too much time for all atom simulations to be performed. In case you can, they still are extraordinarily expensive from the economic, sort of from the monetary, if you want, as well as from the time point of view. So you have to invest a huge amount of computational resources, which implies long times and, um, and a lot of money. And sometimes it might be even overshooting in the sense that you, you need to perform a lot of molecular dynamic simulations to figure out uh, something that eventually can be and should be rationalized at a much coarser level. At the level of you have this domain that moves like this, and this correlates with this other domain, and so on and so forth. So, in order to understand how these large systems uh, work from the biological point of view, there are several questions that can only be answered at the olatum level, but there is a huge amount of questions that can and should be uh, answered in terms of, uh, if you pass me the term, coarse grained uh, terms. That is uh, at the level of detail, at the level, level of resolution, which is much coarser than the atomistic one. So, of course, having mentioned uh, coarsening, coarsening, and coarse greening this much, it is natural to ask oneself whether coarse models can be a solution for these kind of issues. That is, can we 
performed simulations directly at the Cosman level uh, and figure out something about the system. Well, of course we can, and we do that a lot because Cosman models provide a substantial advantage in understanding uh, in understanding these complicated systems. First of all, we have the simplicity uh, and the practicality of having fewer degrees of freedom, which means shorter range interactions, uh, effective interactions, which are smoother, larger time steps, uh, fewer forces, forces to compute. You can run larger simulation, simulations of larger systems for longer times, and something that cannot be uh, uh, cannot be celebrated uh, too little uh, or too much is the fact that you have a huge amount of different coarse grain models available. And this is important because the moment you coarse grain, uh, every system is very specific. And having a huge amount of different coarse grain models uh, off shelf that you can employ allows you to select the particular coarse grain model for that particular problem you have at hand. And this is something very important because there is no one size fits all. However, of course, there is a drawback. You are losing resolution. And because of that, you can only observe those processes that you can embed in an effective representation of your system, both from the point of view of the degrees of freedom as well as regarding the interactions. You have no chemistry dependence unless at a very, uh, again, coarse manner, so in a very effective manner. And if you have processes that start at a certain high detailed level, like Olaton, and they reverberate up to the, to the large scale of the system, you simply cannot observe these processes. You cannot reproduce these processes in, uh, in a coarse grain model. So coarse graining represents, uh, as everything, it has uh, its pros and its cons, but it also provides you with, um, uh, with a twofold way uh, to be employed. That is, on the one hand, you can perform coarse graining in the manner that I mentioned, that is to construct a model which is capable of reproducing, of giving rise to some kind of behavior that you are interested in. So in this case, you have uh, you coarse grain a system to get a model which is simpler, which is cheaper, and you see what happens in that model. So in this sense, you replace higher resolution simulations with something that is cheaper and effective. On the other hand, coarse graining provides you with the tools to perform an olatum uh, molecular dynamic simulation or something equivalent to that, and coarse grain to figure out something that goes on in the system. Because the reason is that uh, when you perform an olatum simulation, you have a large amount of information. You have, in principle, all the information you need, provided that the force field is accurate enough and you have no chemistry, uh, no active chemistry going on in your system. However, you have to figure out what goes on in the system. And of course, in many cases, you know already what to expect. You know where to look in your simulation. But in some time, sometimes you have no way of understanding, uh, of figuring out a priori uh, what you should expect, where you should look to, to understand what your system does. And actually, this is the situation in which you would like to be. That is, the system does stuff that you do not see face first, uh, let's say for, um, first value, face value, and uh, you would like to see that emerge and to understand it uh, once you have performed the simulation. This is the situation in which we were when we performed the analysis of the uh, mutual information pathways. Uh, we performed the analysis, but we didn't know what to expect, and we saw a posteriori what kind of pathways we had in our system. So the question is, is there a way to uh, simplify the amount of information that you get from an Olato molecular dynamic simulation? Is there a way to filter out the information from the noise, starting from an Olato uh, MD, and understand the system in a way that is uh, intelligible for, for us? So you represent the system in an intelligible manner, but at the same time, in a way that is also somehow uh, algorithmic, uh, that is, uh, that doesn't require us to put the answer in the question. From this point of view, course graining offered us a way of uh, doing things. Uh, and the, the way we implemented uh, this idea is the mixed use of the concept of mapping entropy. 
Now, uh, what is mapping? Mapping is basically the low resolution representation in terms of which you look at your high resolution simulation. For us, a mapping is just a selection of coarse grain sites, a selection of atoms that we retain while the rest is simply neglected. In doing this, you can calculate what is called the mapping entropy. The mapping entropy is a pullback Leibler divergence, again, which is a distance between probability distributions. And we have two probability distributions, which come both from the all atom molecular dynamic simulation. This probability distribution is, the, is essentially Boltzmann's probability distribution, that is uh, the one that we sample, that we expect to sample in our uh, all atom MD. And then we have this probability distribution P bar, which is obtained by looking at the olatum trajectory with coarse graining glasses. So this M is the, is the mapping applied to a particular olatum configuration. And this probability is essentially the probability to sample a coarse grained configuration in the olatum set of configurations. So you see that there is coarse graining involved, but there is no process of modeling involved in this, because we are just looking at the all atom configurations in coarse grain terms. And we get this probability distribution of sampling a particular coarse grain configuration, which is the one onto which this particular all atom configuration maps. And then we have a normalization factor, which, is, which simply tells you how many configurations you have that map onto this particular coarse grain configuration. So this is a sort of Boltzmann probability distribution flattened, ironed, so that you have the same probability, the same average probability for all those olatum configurations that map onto the same coarse grain configuration. And this allows us to look for the optimal mapping, which is the one that minimizes this probability distribution. Because once you have flattened the olatum probability distribution, you can look for the for the selection of sites that makes this distance between probability distributions the smallest, which is to say, the moment I have, uh, the moment I look at my system in simplified terms, what is the simplified representation that 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 describes my system with the highest fidelity with respect to the high resolution representation. And this allows us to, uh, to, to perform a minimization procedure and identify those sites that you definitely have to retain in order to minimize in your representation, in order to uh, minimize the distance between the coarse grain representation and the all atom high resolution representation. Here I show you the application of this uh, procedure to a particular case, a particular protein, which is tamapin. It is a relatively small protein, which is uh, a toxin. It binds to an ion uh, uh, channel, to a potassium channel, and uh, essentially kills you. It comes from the venom of a, of a scorpion. And what we did was to uh, look for the particular selection of sites, of atoms in particular, that one has to retain in order to minimize this distance between all atom and coarse grain uh, perspective on your system. And you see the result uh, for the application of, uh, of this procedure to uh, thumb up in with different numbers of sites that you retain. So what do you, what do, you do here? You have, first of all, a bunch of values of the mapping entropy <clears throat> for random choices of your, of your sites. So, so you randomly pick, say, 124 atoms, and you uh, calculate the mapping entropy. This is the bulk of the distribution, so this is the uh, range of values that you explore, but then you can optimize. You can uh, perform a simulated annealing in which you, the objective is to uh, find the particular set of atoms that minimizes the mapping entropy. And you get, if you do this operation a few times, you get several mappings which are uh, whose values of the mapping entropy are located far away from this bulk and uh, are grouped together in relatively narrow distributions. So we perform this operation for uh, different numbers of retained sites. And what you see is that within each group of optimal mappings for a given number of sites, and even across the different groups, there are a few atoms which are uh, 
retained with high probability. Probability, which means essentially how often you find that particular atom in an, in an optimal mapping, in a mapping that is represented, that, that turns out to be optimal from this point of view. And these correspond to the uh, bright lines that you have that you have in these plots. And interestingly, there are two residues that contain atoms that are uh, often typically retained, that are the blue atoms here. And these two residues are the ones that play a crucial functional role in the binding of this protein to its natural substrate, to the ion channel. Note that uh, the, the ion channel was, of course, absent in our simulation. Our simulations were perfectly standard, all out of molecular dynamic simulations of the solvated protein. And there was no uh, information about the binding site or the, uh, or the, uh, the substrate whatsoever. And yet, in this manner, this procedure allowed us to identify two residues that are particularly relevant for the, for the biological function that this protein exploits in interaction with another one. And I skip the, uh, the application to other two relevant cases of much larger, of larger and much larger proteins than tamapin. And the, result, the results are consistent. What turns out is that mapping entropy, which contains information about the energetics of the system, but it doesn't contain information about the interactions with the substrate, is capable of figuring out spots that are particularly relevant for the, uh, for the biological function of these proteins. So this tells you somehow, if you want to construct a model of your system in which uh, you modulate the distribution of detail on your system in a non-uniform manner, you have to retain for sure these few sites. So you, you might construct a model in which you have uh, a few residues that are atomistic and the rest which is cause grain. Which residues should I use? Certainly, I have to keep these residues at the allotment level because they are the important ones for the biological function of the protein. The, the, the problem, the next step, of course, is once I have identified an optimal mapping, I would like to construct a course model onto that. And the, uh, the strategy that we are developing to do that in a, uh, if you allow me, quick and dirty manner is to construct uh, a model that uh, starting just from the uh, from a static structure of the protein, a given force field, and the selection of sites. We call this CANVAS, which is the coarse-grained anisotropic network model for variable resolution simulations. And the variable uh, has to do with the fact that you can provide a mapping in which you have varying degrees of detail, so that you have certain region of the system that is described at the olatum level. Then you have intermediate levels, then you have coarse grained levels. And the construction of the model only relies on a particular structure of the protein itself, of the system itself, and the mapping that you provide. How does it work? Essentially, you start from a protein, which is represented here with a, a substantial uh, huge uh, usage of fantasy as these sites. And you decide that out of those atoms, you want to retain just two of them, the green ones. And the red ones will be discarded. You want to construct a cosmic model in which those two atoms are there. They represent themselves, but somehow they have to uh, account also for the atoms that are not present in the model. How do you uh, build interactions in this case? We do that in a very brute manner, that is to uh, associate the atoms that we remove to the atoms that we keep in a sort of Boronoi-like strategy. That is, if this atom is the closest uh, to this one among the, the retained atoms, then this atom will somehow take care of this. And of course, this holds for the other ones. You remove the atoms you are not interested in, and then you have to endow these uh, residues with these atoms with the properties that they uh, the, such that they account for the uh, elimination of the other degrees of freedom. In principle, if you wanted to do that, uh, let's say in a kosher manner, you would have to perform all, uh, all out of molecular dynamic simulations. And by some kind of course greening procedure, bottom up course greening procedure, you would have to uh, parameterize the interactions and the properties for these sites. We do that in a very, as I mentioned, brute and crude manner. That is the following. We employ a perfectly standard force field, 
uh, with charges with Lena Jones and so on and so forth. And for each of these atoms that are retained and keep track of the of a certain block of atoms that have been removed, you have that the charge is the sum of the charges. The uh, ep the Lena Jones epsilon is the uh, geometric uh, average of the epsilons of all the atoms. The sigma, the Lena Jones sigma, is twice the radius of gyration of the groups of a group of atoms that this site represents. So this is absolutely trivial to do, and uh, and it allows you for and it allows for uh, an immediate parametrization of this otherwise very complicated uh, complicated force field because uh, this employs just the same functional forms that you have in a perfectly standard or force field. It is instantaneous in the sense that you have the static structure. You uh, decide which items to keep. You press a button, and the script tells you what kind of interactions you have to employ. It can be uh, combined with all atom solvent, no matter what, and uh, and and it is very it is immediate because you have interactions between water molecules, ions, and these sites straightforwardly. And then uh, you can perform a simulation in which you have this modulation in the uh, degree of detail across the system. For example, you can apply that to our uh, PET protein, which is uh, adenylate kinase. And uh, we perform simulations. Th these, the ones that I'm presenting now are, are absolutely fresh results, like I got the, the plots yesterday. And uh, simulations are not extraordinarily long for this uh, uh, for the model uh, as of now, like, for example, six, uh, 60 nanoseconds for adenylate kinase. In this, um, uh, in this model, we have the, the lead and the, which is this, and the NMP domain. Uh, which are treated at the uh, at the Coleswind level, and the rest is atomistic. And you see, uh, even though the structure is tilted, the orientation is tilted, you see what the system looks like. You have this large part which is atomistic, and then you have the coarse grain regions, and the atomistic goes into the Coleswind region through a, a region which is an intermediate level of resolution in which you have all the atoms of the backbone only, and the rest is not. Uh, is not present. And then you have only the C alpha atoms. And you see that there is a substantial correlation, at least as far as the root mean square fluctuations uh, are concerned, uh, between the full atomistic simulation, which is a long one, 500 nanoseconds, and the one that we uh, perform, we perform with, the, with the canvas model. Uh, there is a somehow, uh, there, there is some deviation between the two. We expect that, we want that, because of course, uh, we would like to, to sample something with our model that because of time, for example, we cannot sample uh, with an Olato model. So here you see that the, uh, the lead uh, fluctuates much more than it does in the Olato simulation. Uh, the NMP by, uh, fluctuates slightly, slightly less, but again, the simulation, simulation is short. Uh, what matters for us as of now is the, uh, is the trend, is the correlation between the, uh, first of all, the stability of the model, because again, it's super cheap to construct this model. And given the way we construct it, there is absolutely no guarantee that it's going to work. And this already points from our perspective in the, in the right direction. Uh, there is a huge amount of parameterization for the springs and the, and the bonds in this model that is much less trivial than one could expect. So these results are actually comforting for, uh, for us. And even more comforting is the application to the aforementioned Pembrolizumab. Which is uh, modeled in this manner. You have the olatum region, which is essentially just the uh, uh, just the hinge. Then you have a medium grain region in which, as I mentioned, only the the backbone of the uh, of the residues is retained. And then you have the rest in which you keep only the um, the, the C alpha atoms. And you see here the results again, super fresh results, very short simulations for the moment for the 48 nanoseconds, definitely not much for a system that large. But we see a satisfactory, if you allow me, uh, correlation, uh, certainly not in the amplitudes, the amplitudes that we sample in our uh, 500 nanosecond, uh, sorry, 200 nanosecond simulations uh, in, this, uh, in this case. Are much larger than what we see in our much shorter simulations with the with the model, but the trend is there. We see that there is a correlation between the 
uh, between the RMSFs that we compute, and in particular, uh, in particular, what matters for us is what happens in the uh, uh, for the all atomistic uh, residues, which are the, the black uh, dots here, which are uh, sufficiently close to a straight line that doesn't have slope one, because again, the uh, overall uh, amplitudes are uh, are different. But the uh, what is important is that there is a correlation. Uh, between the two. And of course, this is all work in progress. So a lot has to be improved, but we hope uh, by the end of the year to uh, uh, to publish some some uh, update on that uh, on the on the archive. To conclude, uh, we have seen that uh, antibodies, at least this one, the one that we have been uh, working with, uh, are very, very dynamic people. They do stuff and they do stuff uh, showing some correlation that takes place within the system uh, that are uh, that are non-trivial, something that you wouldn't expect to begin with, and uh, an important role in the in the system we've been studying seems to be played by by the hinge in a less trivial manner than what one uh, would expect. Then we have that uh, coarse graining is cool not only because uh, it allows you to construct. Uh, simplified models and to, to run faster for larger systems and so on, so on and so forth. But it is actually something that uh, can be employed uh, as a strategy to, uh, to filter out the relevant information that you have in a molecular dynamic simulation, even though you do not know a priori where to look. And this is, uh, from my perspective, the, the, the most interesting uh, um, direction which coarse graining uh, can move, that is not only uh, understand your system because you have simulated it cheaper, but also understand the system uh, because you have performed an you know, lot of simulation and by cause graining in the right manner, you uh, filter out something that is important, not for you, but for the system itself. And there is a big difference between the two things. And of course, uh, as always in life, one has to uh, pay attention not to overdo the simplification, but of course, this, uh, uh, this is a general, uh, issue with uh, with modeling, and with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if time allows, I'm very happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raffaello. Virtual uh, clap for you. Uh, so, questions? No questions. Lunch time is approaching. Yes, yes. Or you can also uh, use the chat if you want. I remind you. As, sorry, maybe I have a question uh, written uh, myself. So, can you, uh, I mean, with this uh, course grain method, uh, can you? Um, you know, I mean, can, can somehow you simulate also the dynamics of this uh, and how realistic is it? Uh, you, you mean with the, with the canvas uh, model? Or? Yes. Yeah, actually, uh, so we, we perform uh, standard, uh, if you want, molecular dynamic simulation with the model. Sorry. Uh, so the, the, sampling, the sampling strategy is, uh, is, is regular MD. These mm -hmm. simulations are performed also uh, in explicit solvent which from the point of view of gaining time or saving time certainly doesn't help. And this is the reason why the next natural step for us is to combine this method uh, with a, a multiple resolution strategy for the solvent in which since you have an olatum region for your protein and the Korsman region, you treat the solvent olatum only where you have the olatum part of the protein and Korsman the rest. And, uh, but the, eventually you, uh, you, perform, uh, you perform perfectly regular MD and of course, as any uh, coarse grained model, dynamics from the point of view of time uh, has to be taken with a huge grain of salt. Mm -hmm. However, uh, if you want to, to see, for example, conformational transitions, our hope is to, uh, is to come up with a, with, with a method that allows you to see uh, otherwise uh, hard to observe conformational transitions uh, in, in large systems. That would be one of the main uh, applications of this, uh, of this approach together with, for example, binding free energies calculations. Okay. 
Uh, oh, maybe there will be one in the chat. Uh, mm. there, probably there is a question, but uh, someone is saying I must be muted. So maybe, uh, so Patricia, maybe you can write on the, on the chat uh, your question. I don't know. Um, let's see. Yeah, there is someone who wants to ask, probably. Um, okay. I heard a very faint voice. I don't, I don't. How about that? No? Slightly better. No, yeah. Yes. Ah, okay, maybe There now. we go. Okay, uh, so that was my fault, sorry. Uh, I think that, that should be it. All right. Uh, Thanks for the talk. I was wondering about the last part. Um, so, uh, so you you might get or not get the backbone atoms when you do that uh, minim uh, minimization, right? You're not, uh, you're not you're not biased in favor of the backbone atoms, right? You, you mean this or the uh, right? The, this right? Yeah, uh, yeah. We have no. Um, uh, so the, the selection of what atoms to keep at the allotum level, what to cause grain, and so on and so forth, is left completely to the user who have who might have uh, several reasons to make a choice uh, against another. Uh, the the model as it is constructed, as it is conceived, uh, has this uh, region in which you only keep the, uh, the the you keep all the backbone atoms. And you uh, effectively integrate out, if you want, the, uh, the the side chains. But the reason is structural: is to is to keep a smooth transition between the coarser part, in which you only keep the the C alphas, and uh, and the olatum part. However, there is no reason whatsoever why you should keep particularly the C alphas or all the C alphas. You can also uh, decide to retain, say, one C alpha out of two, or only the oxygens, or God knows what. So this is, um, of course, we perform this choice because of simplicity. This is the, uh, let's say, coarse graining amino acids onto the C alphas is the most standard thing uh, that, that you can do. Uh, but this is not necessarily the optimal choice. And actually, what we have seen before about the optimal mappings tells you that this is not necessarily the optimal choice. Right, and you recalculate the forces between each step, right? Uh, we recalculate the forces as in any force field, if this is what you mean. But I mean you the not, parameters. Sorry, not the param. No, no, no. Parameters. Parameters are decided once and for all. They're fixed, right? Which is, uh, which is a, a good approx a huge approximation, of course, but alas, the model is cosmic. Right, and um, and there are repulsive forces, like right. It's not like a normal mode analysis. Like if you try to simulate, you know, if you either time test time step to normal mode analysis. You end up with overlapping atoms because you don't have. No, no, no. No, you have. Uh, so each side that you retain has a charge. If it is non, if it is non-zero, it has uh, a radius. Uh, it, it has an effective sigma, and it has a Leonard Jones parameter epsilon. So there is no overlap. There is no. Um, th those are uh, by all means interaction sites with a finite uh, short-range distance with a. Uh, with the volume and so on and so forth. Right, right, right. Good. Uh, well, I had a few extra questions about the first part, but I don't know if there is time. Uh, yeah, maybe, Patricia, if you don't mind, that we'll, there is another question and then we go back to you. Sure. Is it okay? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so, so yeah. Raffaello, there is yes. in the chat. Uh, and then the cl clustering analysis section, importance of the cluster analysis. Never know. Okay, of course. So let me. Let's see if I can do this in less than 300 years. Probably not. Okay, I, I will start talking in the meantime. So the um, uh, the point is that the uh, the trajectories that we uh, the simulations that we have performed uh, allow the the antibody to explore a large uh, variety. Okay, there we go. What much? Uh, a large variety of conformations, and uh, they are very diverse. And, uh, and there are a lot of conformations uh, per se. So you have, um, okay. So you have, uh, for each state, you have uh, two uh, microseconds of simulation. 
our uh, our objective was to uh, to simplify the the overall amount of data that we get from the simulations by clustering conformations irrespectively of the time sequence so as to group together conformations that are structurally similar and representative of what we might consider a, a macro state uh, a macro state from the conformational point of view of course the uh, what you see here are the most representative conformations of each cluster and the uh, and in each cluster you have fluctuations of the structure about these structures but you see that there is a substantial difference uh, substantial macroscopic rearrangement among the uh, the various conformations so within each state you have uh, you identify these macro states and you can compare also between different states you have the upper state and the hollow state and you see that uh, the the uh, at the coarse grain level from the point of view of the large structure of the conformation of variability uh, the antibody uh, arranges itself in a different manner within each state and across different states and then this allows us this strategy allows us to perform a, sim a simplified comparison between the two i hope i answered your question um, maybe uh Patricia, if you want to ask uh, the, sure. your question. Thank you. Uh, about this, uh, given that you perform clustering and uh, you're interested in correlations between motions, I'm guessing you tried principal component analysis and it didn't work at first? Yeah, so we, we perform PCA uh, within each cluster because, of course, in order for PCA to make sense, you have to have a, a sufficiently decent idea of the reference structure and fluctuations about that uh, doing PCA throughout the trajectory wouldn't have made sense for the, for the same reason I was mentioning, but within each cluster, you have a group of conformations that move around uh, the fluctuate about uh, a well-defined reference structure. We perform PCA in each of them. We calculated the first few normal modes uh, for, uh, for, the, for, each, uh, for each cluster. The analysis is cumbersome because you have these many, uh, you have 10 different uh, uh, conformations and for each you have at least three normal modes that you have to look at. Eventually the, the PCA analysis highlighted some, uh, of course, concerted motions that were consistent with the, with the uh, kind of rigidity that we observed in each cluster, uh, with, the, with the degree of flexibility that the uh, antibody uh, in its uh, generality, in its complexity has, uh, but eventually uh, nothing particularly informative came out of that analysis. It is in the supplementary information uh, of the paper, however. Right, right. And did, did you calculate RMSD between uh, domains or chains? Because I'm seeing, a, so the RMSD values are very high and I'm guessing that one, like you later said, there's a lot of hinge movement and so if you do RMSD on the whole structure and there is a hinge movement, you, you get kind of a... Yeah, so you, uh, you have uh, relatively important fluctuations of the RMSD if you look at the antibody itself, at the whole antibody. Uh, however, if you look at what happens within each domain, let's say the FAB1, FAB2, FC domain, and you look at the antibody within, uh, within sorry, at the RMSD, within each domain, you have much smaller fluctuations. In particular, uh, if you look at the, at the RMSD of each single domain within each single cluster, you have the RMSD that you would expect in a nicely equilibrated simulation. All right. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Okay, I think we stop uh, here.